The scripture today is from Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 through 35, and I will be reading from the New International Version. And I just want to say it was good to have Heather back and have a Princess Poppy up here today. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, His face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Good morning again, church, and welcome to those who are joining in for the sermon part of our portion. We welcome you, and uh, it's great to be with you here on this Sunday. Uh, Before we get to the sermon, we want to take time to remember this great day. Uh, This is Pentecost, and so I want to read you the story, and let's let the Holy Spirit guide us as we hear this once again, this great story of the birth of the church. Happy birthday to the church. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem of God, God God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and other parts of Libya near Cyrene, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Thurgia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, We hear them declaring the words of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. The birth of our church where the Lord brought the Holy Spirit upon his disciples and upon his church. And from there, you keep reading on the story. Peter addresses the crowd and the church. People's lives are changed. And since that day, the church has marched on around the globe every tribe, every nation, every tongue under the sun to see that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. And so we celebrate that here today and we celebrate God's work that continues to work even throughout the ages, here and now, bringing us united with all our brothers and sisters, not only here on this side of life, but also for eternity on the other side of life. And so we celebrate here today. Happy birthday, church. Do, of course, uh, want to open now with a word of prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, again, happy Pentecost. Uh, This is kind of weird for me because this is the first Sunday since I've been a pastor for 10 years or so now that I haven't preached on Pentecost, the Pentecost story specifically. We still read it and enjoyed it and had it. Uh, We're going to be having a Pentecost sermon here today, but a little bit different uh, in the sense of where we're at. Uh, and what I felt the Lord uh, speaking uh, to me these days and what we've seen this week, I thought maybe uh, there was a message that was very more particular for today. And uh, without further ado, we do have Lessons in the Wilderness. We actually made it a sermon series. I didn't know if it was going to happen, but it actually it did work. Uh, so, yay, we have a sermon series. And we'll see, again, every week new changes happen, so I never know uh, my, all my plans get thrown out sometimes. But uh, as I, as we were, as I was, that is, just re- reflecting on this week and reflecting on the words that it really I had uh, shared or was planning on sharing, uh, it was clear that maybe this was a good Sunday to still stick with lessons from the wilderness uh, in this uh, fashion. 
do love this story that we read earlier, the story of Exodus. And uh, if you don't know kind of where this story fits in, let me just kind of give you, give you where we're at. So, of course, you remember, of course, the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites, and Moses, you know, was born and uh, ended up in Pharaoh's daughter's arms and then through the river and then ended up fleeing one day and ended up coming back and challenging Pharaoh and all of God's plagues came upon the Egyptians. And the great story of the Exodus where the people were allowed to go free, they ended up, uh, you know, of course, leaving, being chased by Pharaoh. They get across the Red Sea, and once they get there, uh, they start camping different places. They end up at Mount Sinai, and Moses goes up to Mount Sinai. God gives them the letters of the law and starts teaching. He writes down on the Ten Commandments, on the tablets, that is, the Ten Commandments, uh, as well as many other instructions that he brings down the mountain. And when he comes down the mountain, what are the people doing? They've totally abandoned God, worshiping idols, worshiping the golden calf of Egypt, uh, and, and just indulging in all sorts of revelry uh, that he sees. And, and the story, if you remember, Moses gets so mad when he sees it, he takes the tablets and smashes them and breaks them. Mm-hmm. Well, you fast forward the story, you know, God's not done with his people. Uh, eventually, Moses is called upon to make another set of tablets, and so he makes the Ten Commandments Part 2, if you will. Same, same instructions. But again, a new uh, new set of tablets. And we get to this point where God is really focusing on, hey, people, I have called you. This is a time of us coming together. This is a time where my people, I'm going to teach you my laws. I'm going to teach you how to be my people, different from the whole entire world. And that you are going to be basically my ambassadors to the world, that the world is going to see you through me. And I am claiming you as mine. The people of the promise, the seed of Abraham, you are mine, and I'm going to do great things through you. And of course, people had no clue in those days that eventually this would lead to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and, and God himself putting on flesh and coming to earth. And that great story that we celebrate every Sunday. But at this point in the story, you know, God, he's brought down again the, the tablets, Moses, that is. He's got the second set, and he's instructing the people. And God does something sort of very peculiar. If you remember these stories, whenever God's showing up, there are thunderous mountains, there's like lightning, there's uh, fire, pillars of fire, there's earthquakes, there's all this great, you know, cacophony of things going on that God's presence shows up and the people go, okay, well, there's no doubt there is a God, right? And no doubt this God is right before us. Unequivocally, everybody knew this. And God not only, you know, has these moments where he brings Moses out and speaks to Moses, but this peculiar thing that we read about happens, right? Where Moses would go... And, uh, you know, as he comes down from Mount Sinai, he comes down from speaking with the Lord, and his face, it says in Scripture, is radiant. Now, if you have an imaginative mind like me, and, you know, as a kid trying to draw these stories sometimes in Bible stories, and, you know, I always wondered, like, what does that look like? What does radiant look like? And, and of course, you know, I, it's sort of the image of a sun is what, you know, my mind goes to. But his face is so radiant, it's blinding. And it's so radiant that people... They, they have trouble even looking at him. And, and what it was was not because Moses was so holy. It was because the glory of the Lord just imbued Moses. Just by Moses being with God, just being in God's presence, just speaking with him, God imbued Moses with a portion of that power, if you will. And Moses would walk out. The people would undoubtedly know that this man was talking with God. He was going to give us instruction, and we should listen. But God's glory was shown through Moses. Not metaphorically even, literally shown through Moses. And so much so that he, he ended up putting on a, a, a well, you should say a face covering nowadays, right? But a, a, a face mask, if you will, speaking to the people, but he had a veil, it says in Scripture, kind of covering his whole head. And, uh, you know, I don't know if this is where halos kind of, you know, like the idea of, did he have a halo kind of about when he had the mask on, or did did he, did he just have his, like his skin golden color and just shining? You know, what does that look like? But uh, all sorts of imaginative ideas. But his, whatever it was, his face was so imbued with the glory of God that the people had trouble even being in Moses' presence. And so he put on the veil, and it says in our scripture as we read that whenever Moses would go into the tent of the meeting where, where God would say, hey, Moses, come in over here and, and meet with me. Moses would go into that tent, and he'd unveil himself and talk with God. And then God would give instruction, and Moses would come back out, and he'd be so radiant, he'd put on the veil again. And uh, like last week, I know we talked about the, the pillars of fire, the pillar of cloud, but Scripture never really attests to, like, when did this end? You know, like, when does this actually stop? 
but nonetheless, um, for a time at least, Moses' face was so radiant that all the people around them knew God's presence just by looking at Moses. I find that story uh, comforting in these days. I don't know about you, I, I find that story comforting because, you know, as I think about, of course, being a leader in any way, but in the today's world, but, you know, as, as a person who's trying to follow God, even, like, not even if you have leadership roles, you're just, you're just, you know, the world would see you as a nobody, the person that does all the jobs no one else wants to do, but in God's kingdom, you're a follower, you are his son and daughter, and you are God's child, and that, you know, God's glory can shine through you to others in amazing ways. I love the fact that this story, God's presence, is just there in so many different ways. But at some point, God says, I'm going to stop showing up in the pillar of cloud. I'm going to stop showing up in that pillar of fire. I'm going to stop even showing up in the lightning and the thunder and the earthquakes and all the craziness that the people saw. Even the plagues, to a certain degree, you know, of smiting even your enemies. I'm going to show up through a person. One of the greatest old preacher stories, you've heard it before, I'm going to tell it again. I'm going to tell it Jonathan style, because, you know, whenever you retell these stories, you've got to put your own flavor to it, right? But there was a story, you know, this old, old preacher story where uh, God's in heaven, and, you know, he's, he's created the earth, and he's talking about, you know, he, creation of humanity, and all the angels are looking at him, and they're kind of like, hey, God, are you sure this is a good idea? You know, they're going to really mess up, and, and when things go south, you know, like, stuff's going to go really bad, and, and things are going to happen, and God says, yep, yep, we're going to do this. And, and the angels look at him and say, well, how you, what are you going to do, right? How, how are you going to be present in the world? And God says, well, you know, I'm going to use the people. You know? I'm going to, you know, just let them be my ambassadors to this world. I'm going to fill them in my Holy Spirit, and they're just going to go off and do all the good deeds and, and, and just transform the world. And all the angels, you know, look at God dumbstruck, and they're like, all right, God, uh, you know, tenderly, they're looking at God, and they're like, hey, God, that's a, a nice, nice idea. Uh, what's plan B if that doesn't work? And God, of course, looks at them and says, there's no plan B, right? And if you think about the world and think about how God has worked throughout human history, there's so much kind of elements of truth to that little narrative in there, that God has entrusted you and I to be ambassadors of his glory. And as Christians, there's no Christian under the sun that's ever lived who's a follower of Christ who doesn't have that as part of their vision and purpose in life, that you and I, as followers of Christ, are by default God's ambassadors, God's fingerprints on this world, the face of the living God. And of course, what we always have to stop and ask ourselves and reflect upon occasionally is, what is shining out of us? What's shining out of us? Are we radiant like Moses where people know they've met with the living God and it's undeniable these people, these crazy Christians, worship a God and there's something to it because this God just shines through them? Or do we often fall short of that and really take up maybe our golden calves and worship our idols? But in maybe even more subtle ways, we trade the glory of God for the things of this world and we settle for human creations over what God wants to do in our life. I think it's pretty clear from this week the world needs God. I mean, uh, I don't know any pastor this Sunday that's not preaching that message right here, right? This right, especially in America here today, that this world needs God. Right? And specifically for us in America and the United States, uh, specifically, the world needs, or Jesus is needed in the United States. But it's so true that in God's present nature, He uses you and I. And I wouldn't say that's not, that's not true, that there's no plan B. God does show up in amazing ways and does amazing things occasionally. But it's so true that his default plan is to use you and I as his ambassadors for glory and for love and for truth. I uh, was so moved to think about this week. It's amazing how it brings about other aspects of life that you've been through. One of my uh, memories was when I was an intern at a church. Uh, it was actually the church I grew up in that let me intern there as kind of a youth helper, if you will, and a youth pastor, and, and they would go on a yearly uh, youth mission trip, and one of the years we went to Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, if you've never been to Gulfport, it was basically right near New Orleans in that whole area where uh, when Hurricane Katrina came in and all the floodings that happened, 
uh, you know, Gulfport's kind of a, a casino town, and so you could, when we went there, even, uh, it was a long, actually quite a bit after when Katrina came through, there were still just death, devastation everywhere, just houses still just bound to the ground, few businesses open, people, you know, wondering what to just rebuild with their lives. Uh, in so many ways, it was clear that Katrina was still affecting those people and would be long after we left. But we did all sorts of good work, but one of the people we got to work with was a police officer. And uh, this police officer, I, honestly, I, I thought long and hard this week, I could not remember his name at this point, but, uh, you know, he uh, seemed like a good man. And he was with us and just kind of telling us about the areas and what had happened, giving us a tour even, sharing with us the stories and things that had gone on with Katrina, through Katrina, after Katrina. And he was sharing with us uh, how, you know, he showed us a video of he and his wife, you know, as, as critical people that couldn't leave and even the areas that were being flooded, his own house being flooded to the degree they were up in the rafters of their attic pulling their dogs, standing on the rafters, right, and kneeling on the rafters because the flood water was coming up. And, you know, if you've ever seen these types of videos before, you know that look in people's eyes where they know there's nothing else to do, like this is this could be it. And they kind of resign themselves in the sense of like they're doing everything they can, but they're not even freaked out anymore because they just know they've done all they can. I mean, that was that moment where you could see it in his wife's eyes and the dog was barking and freaking out and everything they could do, just knowing like if these floodwaters keep coming, there's no one to help us. We are the help. There's no one to help us, you know. And uh, in those moments of scariness, he was shared videos with that. And he told us story after story of the looting and having to try to police that. Even stories like, you know, there were people that, you know, their homes totally devastated, laid bare everywhere. But they would go and they would sit in their chairs on their, their front yards just to try to protect. And, uh, you know, the looters would come by and try to shoot them off. And he would tell stories of, of looters that would come out that were so aggressive. You know, they would just come out ready and people would be there. They just wouldn't care at all. They would just, you know, do some physical violence if they had to and whatever, even to the degree where they would, you know, put people in the hospital, take their stuff and go on and loot the next place. And there were stories even of just people that were so brazen that there was one guy that, you know, he was sitting on his yard, had his gun, gave the people warning and warning, finally shot a bullet over their head just to just get their attention and finally the looters left. But that's how brazen it was. It was just so over the top of of uh, you know not helping your fellow man but doing harm to them, and the policing and the hardship of going through that, and the cleanup of what happened afterwards, and being all sorts of parts of that, and he and he told us all these stories, but he wouldn't leave us alone. Like in the sense of like he, you could tell he wanted to be around us. That's what I remember so vividly. Uh, you know there was actually a number of us. I would say there's probably 60 of us that went on this this trip, including the adults, and we had to break up in groups, and we're doing different things at houses and food pantries and all sorts of good work in the community, and uh, I remember, you know, one of the nights, last night, he wanted to take us to one of the few restaurants that were open still, so we all, you know, went over, and, and he was telling us uh, just thank you from the bottom of his heart, because he got assigned to be with us during this time to semi-protect us, but more or less just kind of tell us the stories and help us to understand what was going on and make sure we had everything we needed. You couldn't really go down the store and buy what you needed, right? And, uh, and so to make sure we had what we needed to do good work. But the thing I remember most about this police officer is he told us, after telling us, you know, story after story every day of every day, and that final night he told us, you know, I want to thank you because as a cop I see so much the badness of humanity and especially this experience. I saw so much evil. And these were the exact words he said. He said to us, you know, you coming down here, you've restored my hope in humanity that there are good people. And it was amazing in those moments, you know, when, you, when you're just sitting there and you're, you know, we're a youth group, right? So we're, we're having a blast doing all the things we're doing. We're being silly and, you know, doing all sorts of stuff. But we're working hard, too, you know, and we're doing the best to, you know, get the kids to make sure the paints were all right on the wall and the things are level that we're, you know, cutting out of the wall and doing these different things and redoing all the different light switches and all, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can, but you look at it back on it and you're like, these poor people, like their house was not the fixer up or house from like the TV, you know, like remodel. This was, this was what you would expect a bunch of youth coming in to do and, and help as much as they can. But we did, you know, all this work and we had a lot of fun doing it and so many great memories of of, uh, you know, people of just doing what they can to help others and taking you know, some of their vacation time in the summer to go do good work. 
And all the while, the police officer was watching us, right? And, you know, thinking back on it, you know, when we first got there, he wasn't gruff with us. You know, he could tell we were there to do a good thing, but you could tell he was really cautious. But by that end, he was telling us, you know, you and your group, this group of young people, restored his faith in humanity because he had seen so much evil. Don't want to downplay ever the role of even simple, small things that we do for our fellow humans that do good work. I wanted to say some words about the protests that we've been seeing, and especially to, you know, the people who aren't Christians, this is what, you're not going to understand this, and I get that. And if you're watching with us today, I just hope these words just sort of plant a seed in your heart. But if you're a Christian here today, I wanted to share some words with you, and that is um, these few things is that, well, there's a bunch of things to really share, but just to name a few. Is the first thing is, is you're called to stand up for human, your fellow human man. You're also called to stand up for the fellow human authorities. And you're also called to do it in the way Jesus calls you to do. One of the things that was so striking to me, I, I, I actually really love Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I, I actually studied a lot of his, uh, I call him sermons, people call him his speeches, but he was a pastor, and I, as a pastor, I see just him relying on God to use his speeches even. But it's so blaringly obvious how things have changed from then and now. And even back then, there were violent outbreaks and all those different things. That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people claiming peaceful protests. And so if you're a Christian here today, yeah, absolutely. You have the right to protest. I agree with that. I agree to some degree. You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so it's kind of hard to know exactly how to do that. But to use your voice to speak up for those who truly are being you know, persecuted and, and, and truly being treated with brutality, yes, we're called to do that. At the same time, though, this statement that I've heard over and over and over again does not ring true for a Christian to use it the way it's been used. And what I mean by that are these words. It is my First Amendment right to have the freedom of speech, so you can't take that away from me. Now that's true, right? You have that right. But as a follower of Christ, you have to do it in a certain way. And the way I've been seeing even so many, even just... <laughs> Even people that are part of our political process that are trying to do good say that they're being peaceful protests. The peacefulness that God talks about peace is different from saying I'm a first in the minute right and I just blast a police officer in front of me. And so many people I've seen say I'm peaceful protest. And what they mean by that is I'm not armed, right, physically, and I'm not throwing rocks. But with their words, they are throwing and hurling enemy and bishop hyssop into a police officer standing there with a shield. And I have to challenge you, as brothers and sisters in Christ, that is not the way Christ calls you and I to protest at all. I hearken back just a few years ago, and I'm sure these stories are happening, and we're just not seeing it as much on the news but remember even the, not riots, but the, the protests that happened even in 2015 and before, where we saw even people coming up saying kind words to the police officers and saying, you know, we know you were not the one to do this. And we understand you're here to protect us. And we are here to stand with you and them. We want to stop all this unnecessary things that are happening. We want to stop the brutality. We want to stand up for this. But we know you are a, human, a fellow human as well. And we want you to know we love you. And I remember just seeing that on camera over and over and over of people even hugging cops, sending good things to the police officers and all these different things, and saying kind words and notes and exchanging all sorts of just good things with each other. And what I think you see now is this idea of we've come to a place where we're continuing to become less and less guided by the words of Jesus. And I think it's a very, very tempting thing just like the Israelites, who were there that day, and they said, hey, Moses went up on the mountain. We don't know where he went. He's been gone. He, for all we know, he's dead. Let's just all get together, and let's just make a golden calf, and let's worship it, because that's the easy thing to do. 
mean, the people of God were misled. And if you and I aren't careful, we can get wrapped up into this idea of this kind of American individualism of it's my right to say what I want and I don't care how harmful it is and how righteously angry it is and I don't care how in your face it is and I don't care how you know inflammatory it is and I don't care how degrading it is to my fellow human being. That does not fly in the kingdom of God at all. It may be your right under the Constitution, but Jesus does not permit that. And if you're going to follow him, you have to love the officer on the other side, even as you stand up against brutality. And I think we have to hold these two things true, is that there are a lot of good, good, good police officers. If there weren't, this world would be more chaotic than we've ever seen, right? That, the signs that you see, all cops are bad, nah, not true. And at the same time, I think we all understand that we've seen time and time again racism play out in our country. And I think we're in those days where the word is getting hit out, and this world does have to change. And I think as Christians, we're okay with that one. Remember, the, the vision is that the heaven, that every tribe, every nation, every every language that's ever existed on this planet stands before God and is glorifying God all together. And I don't know if we're still all doing our own language or if there's like a heavenly language we all speak or how that works, but nonetheless, everybody's there. And so we do, of course, as a church and as followers of Jesus Christ, speak out of anything that would segregate people by the color of their skin or any other treatment of people differently based on that, absolutely. But we do that in the way of the cross, where Jesus, remembered did not say a single thing of hatred to the soldiers that arrested him. And even as they beat him, he would say things like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said those exact words while he was on the cross, and the soldiers cast lots before him. And the Jewish leaders and the other leaders of the time stood there and mocked him to death. That's the type of protest we're called to be as Christians. If you go back and look at the 1960s protests and many of the leaders that were there, and what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would say himself, it was not just, once again, an, a, a policy decision to do nonviolent protests. It was the heart of God. To understand that the person you're speaking up against and the people that you're trying to help change and to help see differently, help them see differently and to make policy decisions and all these things, those people are also your fellow human beings. That you're called to love them. If you look at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s words, he said over and over and over and over the idea that the people filled with hatred that are full of racism are victims just as much as others that they're entrapped and enslaved by the way of their thinking and they need to be set free as their fellow human brothers just as much as we, the oppressed people, need to be. So I challenge just all those Christians, brothers and sisters that are out there, again, you're called to protest. That's great. We've got pandemic going on, so you've got to do that in the right way. You've got to do that in a loving way, and you've got to do that in the way Jesus Christ called you to do even love shown towards someone even causing violence, even arresting you. I just long for the day when maybe someone would have that element and you know, the, you've seen so many of the different news anchors interview people being you know, detained and the person would say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I came out here to love and the officer who's arresting me. I just want them to know I love them. I'm here for peace. I'm here for justice. That justice the way God sees things, not the way my anger sees things. Those stories happened in the 60s, and if they don't start happening again, there's no end to this. And this doesn't become a step of justice. This becomes what you're seeing. And in fact, if you look at it, I think there's a covenant to be say that many of our protests, really, if you look down the philosophy behind and underneath them, is more of an atheistic philosophy than it is a follower of Jesus. So we need to stop worshiping the calf. we got to come back to the Lord. So again, as your church and as your, your pastor and those that would listen to this, I'd encourage, yes, we stand with those that are saying, hey, this is not okay. But we also stand with so many of our officers that 
constantly are doing good work. They are now put into an impossible situation. We stand with them as well. And we can do both things as followers of Christ. As we're here, I wanted to share with you one last thing. If you thought maybe this was ending in Pentecost in the sense of that God was done right then and there on that day and that all those different things came to fruition and that was the end of it. That's not. God is still speaking to you and me, still doing amazing things. I wanted to read you at the closing part of this sermon, words from Galatians chapter 4. And Paul says to this to the church and would say this to you and I. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time is set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of this world. Now what he's saying is that he's arguing with the Galatians, hey, this whole idea of the law and following it, there's no greater law even apart from that. It's the part that Jesus Christ has given us. So he's been laying the groundwork for what he's about to say right here and all. He says, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of God, his Son, into our hearts. And the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Remember, that's what Jesus said on the cross, Abba, Abba. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God is also made you an heir. Now Paul in these words is really describing the, the tension of looking at the law and looking at being a Christian and what that looks like for Jews and non-Jews and all these different things. But I don't want you to miss his words. The Spirit of God lives in us. Cries out in us, Abba, Father. In other words, what I'm saying to you, church, is that idea of Moses and the radiant face that you would go out before and that your protests or your words or the way you live your life or the good works you do or the people that you help or whatever it is you're doing would shine so brightly that people could undeniably see God's Holy Spirit living in you. See that you're a child, a son, a daughter of God, just as Paul says in these words, that that Spirit's not just something that's given to a few, it's given to all of us through Jesus Christ. So I challenge all of us to once again receive that Spirit, to allow that Spirit to live through us, and even in these dark times, to be radiant. God's love. Let us pray. God, as we're here today, we live in trying times. And it's true that your church throughout the ages had try, has had trying times through trying times through trying times. And God, your church still is here. And Lord, we with the communion of saints, not only that have gone before us, but even here today that live through all these different things, we link arms with each other to have a different voice in this world. And that, Lord, let it never be said that the Christians would ever say or do harm to a fellow man. The Lord would even be persecuted for righteousness, that would even be nonviolent, even when violence is done against them. And that Lord would even bless those who would cause harm. For God, that is the cross you've called us to live, to pick up and to follow you. As God, as we hear today, we do pray for our nation. But we specifically pray for any leaders that are invited to the table, because we know there's only so many that get to be there. That those leaders who want to follow your law above all laws. And that God, in your spirit, in the spirit of what we saw in the 1960s of people truly doing nonviolent protests in the nonviolence you call nonviolence, that God, that spirit would once again settle and live in the hearts of our leaders. And that God, they could bring us to a new land, a new place. Where Lord, truly that dream of that all people of all colors, nations, and races, and as Martin Luther King Jr. said it, that little black boys and little black girls and little white boys and little white girls, even in the towns of Georgia, in the middle of racism, to play together and be one. God, we pray that as our hope. And we pray it not only as our ambition, but as one strategy and one goal that we're going to drive towards and live for you and for your kingdom.
Amen.